So first of all, thank you all very much for um, enrolling in this class. Um, obviously, I can't speak for everybody. It's nice to be comfortable from the confines of one's home, but you know, I think uh, many of us would have rathered if this would have been, um, <clears throat> you know, officially in a classroom. But I think given the uh, recent surge, it's quite understandable. And so uh, life is all about curveballs. And so we're going to be starting this session uh, virtual. So uh, can you all see basically my screen? It, it works just uh, full screen now. Yep. All right, magic. So um, the Rob Mason, who is one of the teachers at McGill approached me, uh, I was playing soccer with him for the past couple of years. And I went and I spoke to his class and he could tell that I was very passionate, not just about entrepreneurship, but really being in a classroom, virtual or real. Um, and he said that there was this class, the USA 664, 665, managing the small enterprise, which was really all about, you know, business plans. And, um, you know, the business plan to me is a means to an end. And so when he asked me if I would be interested in, in you know, stepping in a classroom and sharing some of my experiences, I was really excited. And when we started to kind of bounce back ideas, um, I kind of said, you know, the, the almost subtitle of this class is from concept to reality, which is if and when an individual finally has that calling, um, that purpose, eventually a product or service, how do you take that from just an idea and actually build a product, a service, a company, an organization, a culture and all that? So, um, my name is Ashkan Karvis Fushan. Um, I studied at Concordia and for the past 20 years I've worked in media. Um, and so in today's class on the anniversary of the insurrection at the US Capitol, uh, we're gonna really first talk a little bit about kind of the fiber of entrepreneurship. And so, you know, while I was completing my Bachelor of Commerce at the John Wilson School of Business, I actually was very fortunate enough. A teacher asked me if I'd be interested in lecturing. Uh, undergraduate, and then eventually master's and PhD students. Nobody really knew uh, that I myself was just an undergrad. Uh, and that was about 23, 24 years ago. So I'm really, really proud and I was really flattered and, and thought it was a great opportunity to uh, kind of come full circle and uh, give this class. Uh, so throughout my career, I've always written quite a bit. I'm at heart really a researcher, uh, kind of an amateur historian. I've published over a thousand articles on leadership, management, success, not just in business, actually, just in sports and relationships, just how people succeed, how people overcome setbacks. Um, I've published also three books. One was called Course to Success, Everything You Need to Succeed Beyond School, which actually would be quite perfect for you guys. And I will make these available for free if you want to download the ebook. I don't really think in this first class that I'm giving, I'm going to have any so-called required reading. I know you guys are busy. I think it's more, I almost want you guys to show the initiative and want to read. But I will be sharing uh, a list of suggested readings and just, you know, free stuff, free books of mine, but also just a lot of links that I refer to. Um, and Elias will help me make sure that that's coordinated properly and we share all that with you. My second book was called The Confessions of Alexander the Great of always been very much interested in history and you will see that theme throughout. It's literally as if Alexander the Great was writing his own autobiography. Again, happy to share that with you. And then the third one, which I wrote 10 years after the first two, was the 10 year overnight success, um, how Watch Mojo built the most successful brand on YouTube. It's really an entrepreneur's manifesto. Uh, it talks about the YouTube revolution, um, but through my experiences, with Watch Mojo on YouTube. Uh, I've been involved with three of the most successful consumer digital media companies out of Canada. Mama, which I'll discuss, was a search engine very early before even Google was around. Um, Ask Men, which was an online men's magazine started by three fellow colleagues of mine at Concordia. I joined them very early. That was acquired by IGN Entertainment, which itself was swallowed by News Corp. I'll discuss a lot of those experiences as well. And then Watch Mojo, which I started in 2005, six. Spoken a lot of very fortunate in a lot of different great cities around the world on all these themes. And in 2015, Ernst & Young was kind enough to award us the Entrepreneurship of the Award in Media and Entertainment in Quebec, which is packaged as an individual award, but it really reflects the company, the success of the organization. Um, 
The only thing I'll add is if you're wondering about the name, I was born in Iran in 1978, briefly lived in Spain for a year, and I've been in Canada all my life. So I'm probably a bit more Western in, in thinking and culture, and I'll talk a lot about nature and nurture. Uh, wanted to do investment banking consulting, but then I was you know, lured by the promise of the web. I was an entrepreneur in the first part of my career. I wasn't really driven or confident enough to think I could pull it off, but then I got the entrepreneurial bug and started Watch Mojo. Um, I was turned down by over a hundred investors. I'll discuss all that as well. But then I basically took about a quarter million dollars, which is what I had saved up and what I'd earned from Ask Men. And I poured it all into Watch Mojo. I indebted myself another half a million dollars. We broke even in 2011 and we've been profitable since, which is pretty rare. A lot of media companies, tech companies are not necessarily profitable. We never had any outside investors until December 31st, 2020. So just over a year ago, we did a deal. I'll allude to that a little bit. And I've been very fortunate to work with the same other four co-founders, one of whom is my spouse, which really is rare. Uh, and I'm a proud father of two daughters aged 13 and 11, whom I think I'm teaching a lot about life, but really they're teaching me. Uh, I enjoy cooking, traveling, and once upon a time, I was a prolific amateur soccer striker, and I will touch on that later on in this class and explain why it's pertinent. And if you have any questions, because I'm full screen, uh, maybe just speak up or you know, maybe ping Elias and Elias can jump in. Uh, I want to make this as interactive as possible, but uh, recognize that doing this virtually, uh, it might not be obvious, whereas usually I would see somebody looking confused or having a question and encourage them to speak up. Um, so quickly, I just want to explain that we're going to look at a lot of historical profile of entrepreneurs. We're going to discuss, touch on the technical and um, industrial revolution and that impact on entrepreneurship. We're going to discuss some of the ingredients of success, the pillars of success, uh, which really are like marketing, finance, and all that. The themes um, that you come across, competition, disruption, innovation. And again, really, <clears throat> I told McGill that I was not going to come and spend a whole term dissecting a business plan, which between us, I've invested in 30 startups in the last couple of years, and not a single one of them had a business plan. Maybe that's a bad <laughs> reflection of me in terms of due diligence, but it's a means to an end, and we're going to discuss that. And we'll look at some case studies, there will be some assignments, and eventually a presentation. The course composition will include articles you will read, videos you will watch, and one video that you will create, as painful as that sounds. Uh, there'll be some homework assignments. There's eventually going to be a class presentation. Uh, we're going to look at some case studies and you will all do one and I'll explain how that fits into your grade. I'll try to bring some speakers, um, which are always a nice touch, despite the fact that we're doing this virtually. And I would like to encourage as much participation and attendance, and that could be inside the classroom and outside. This is going to be a very cross-disciplinary course. I'm, I, business is not, you know, success in business cannot be attained in a vacuum. We're going to touch on history, psychology, sociology, anthropology. I'm a big music, sports, and entertainment guy. And there will be some military anecdotes, even though I'm a very peace-loving individual. Um, these pillars that we're going to look through, almost one per class, include finance and accounting, marketing, sales, strategy, product development, HR management, culture, corporate development, which is mergers and acquisitions, as well as technology, which is kind of omnipresent these days. Your great composition. Uh, it, it's almost like gestalt, the sum of the parts, right? So ultimately, there does need to be a business plan or exceptionally, maybe just an executive summary. Um, but you're all going to kind of like work on parts of it, which will come together to create kind of the macro analysis, the SWOT, explaining why it is that you're doing what you're doing in terms of picking a product and service that you're going to take from concept to reality. I'm going to dive into this a little bit more later on in today's class, so we don't need to go into it, but I really tried to build something that was fun, fair, and ultimately fruitful. Um, so because to do well in this class and in entrepreneurship, really it boils down to these four uh, ultimate questions. Can you articulate what the hell it is you're trying to accomplish? Can you access the capital you need, whether it's through savings, your rich uncle, or through outside sources, a bank or an investor? Can you recruit the kind of talent that you need to build a winning team? Because look, I'm very ambitious and I'm very driven and I'm a relatively smart person. There's no way I would be where I am today without my spouse, my team, my employees, the, the greater community at large. And then finally, can you deliver a return of some kind to your stakeholders? And you notice I said stakeholders and not shareholders. So in case you haven't suffered enough at the end of this course or throughout, 
You can follow me on Twitter where I do share some interesting things on business and a lot of more irreverent nonsense. LinkedIn, where I write and share a lot of things that are obviously more pertinent to this universe. Um, Watch Mojo is a house of brands. So under the context brand, we also produce articles as well as videos that are a bit more geared towards entrepreneurship. They include a lot of interviews. So again, if you're into this stuff, those are probably some resources that you might find useful. So assuming there are no questions, um, again, because I can't see you all, um, I'm just going to dive in answering what is entrepreneurship? So I like this quote quite a bit. Entrepreneurship is living a few years of your life like most people uh, won't so that you could spend the rest of your life like most people can't. And the idea there is, is that it is not for everybody, but it is, frankly, it's kind of an investment. You're, you're sacrificing a lot so that over time you reap the benefits and the benefits are not necessarily tangible. It is very much intangible. Uh, entrepreneurship is the activity of setting up a business or businesses taking on financial risks in the hope of profit. Um, and then the, an entrepreneur is basically the person who organizes and operates a business and as much as I try to use neutral, if I ever use he, uh, I apologize, it's, uh, I try to avoid that. But it is basically the person who then leads that risk-taking, puts their neck on the line, um, and, and you know, could basically is accountable to all these other stakeholders. The one thing I want to stress is entrepreneurship is not a privilege. It is, uh, is a privilege, sorry. It is not a right. Um, a lot of people these days want to be an entrepreneur because it's become sexy. 30, 40, 50 years ago, maybe you wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer to please your mother, your father, your uncle, your aunt, your grandmother. Um, but I think then there was a period where everybody wanted to be an investment banker, a hedge fund manager, because I think they just like the money. Um, today, when you look at, you know, despite the, the bad parts of Facebook, when you look at Mark Zuckerberg, when you look at Elon Musk, I think it's become a very in vogue, sexy thing. But you have to understand that with good comes a lot more bad. And this class is gonna kind of prepare you for that. And it's gonna be a gut check to determine if you really wanna pursue this path, this lifestyle. And it is absolutely a lifestyle. It is not a nine to five thing. It is unfortunately or fortunately a 247, 365 thing. Now this begs the question, what is the difference between entrepreneurial and being an entrepreneur? Now, if this was in class, I would probably open it up a bit more, but for the sake of time today, we're gonna to come back to this but that in the back of your mind, you should be asking yourself, well, what is the difference between being entrepreneurial and an entrepreneur? So entrepreneurs over the years, I alluded to Alexander the Great. Look, back in the day, if you were an ambitious young lad or an ambitious young lady, you would basically mobilize troops and go conquer far off lands. Alexander the Great was the quintessential kid who was born on third base and more on this later, but he actually went on and he built a far greater empire than his father, King Philip of Macedon could ever imagine. I actually wrote my second book on Alexander the Great. And when I said entrepreneurship is a two, four, seven thing, I actually kept the rights because I wanted to one day create a derivative project on it. Now, this class is gonna talk a lot about psychology. We're gonna talk about the mental toughness and the resilience needed. And frankly, when I say that it's a privilege and not a right, it's because it's very competitive. Um, when you see this, these clouds, it basically means it foreshadows something. So I may drop this image throughout the presentation, throughout the class, and it basically means, hey, we're going to touch on this as a tangent, and I'm going to come to it later. So later on, when we talk a little bit about legal, uh, I don't want to talk about it in abstract. When we talk about non-disclosure agreements, when we talk about litigation, defamation, and frankly, the mental toll of entrepreneurship, Here's a good example, just diving into it. 14 years after I wrote the book in 2017, I was introduced to a fellow entrepreneur in this city, a very accomplished lawyer, movie producer be behind the movie Rocket Man, the story of Elton John. And I told him about my you know, desire one day to produce a project around Alexander the Great. And she told me about her ideas regarding kids programming. I told her about it, yada, yada, yada. She decided to pursue it without me obviously sucks, we're gonna come back to this. The point is that when you are choosing your product and your service, you're actually choosing the people that you need to partner with. Success in life is actually 80% what you avoid, whom you avoid, what you pursue, what you don't pursue. This class will teach you the framework to approach not just products and services, but people and situations so that you ultimately have the privilege that I do, which is surround yourself with people 
who could build a business with you. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody. Jesus Christ throughout history. Was Jesus Christ an entrepreneur? I'm not the first to have thought of this. Here's a bunch of articles. The point I'm getting at is throughout history, entrepreneurship has always really existed. It's just that in the last 10, 20, 30 years, we refer it as something distinct and different when in fact, the same way that we are all salespeople, we just don't know it, we are all, we all have to be entrepreneurial even if we're not necessarily entrepreneurs. Genghis Khan, quote, the greatest happiness is to vanquish your enemies, to chase them before you, to rob them of their wealth, to see those dear to them bathed in tears, to clasp to your bosom their wives and daughters. Ouch, how is that different than this guy, Jeff Bezos, right? Same vibe, I'm just kidding. But you get the idea. Entrepreneurship has always been a thing. Christopher Columbus, he spent seven years pitching his business plan to bankers before actually convincing the king to give him the resources necessary to basically go out and conquer new land. So we're going to talk a lot throughout this class about entrepreneurship. A lot of the success and failures boil down to figuring out how people before you were facing a similar fork in the road and how they made decisions. So because of my background and experience in media, um, a lot of the examples are going to hinge on media. There's an article I've written, which is, I believe, linked to, and again, we'll follow up. We'll touch on people who built enterprise and finance and industry, but admittedly, this class will skew a lot more to media and the internet. Thomas Edison um, was labeled difficult. His mother was ill. His father was out of a job, but ultimately he was one of the greatest inventors of all time. He was also very commercially savvy, um, but his personality led him to get fired quite a bit. Um, in fact, what's interesting though about Edison is Edison had so many patents that a lot of the business people who ended up building Hollywood, they decided to leave the East Coast and head to Los Angeles, not just because of the weather, although that I'm sure played a part into it, but because back in the day, geography was an obstacle to litigation. So Hollywood's roots, ironically, considering how much they hate piracy, considering how much they get on a kind of moralistic stand and say, you know, don't do this or don't do that. Don't use our IP, our intellectual property. All of Hollywood's history was actually all around circumventing copyright and patents and all that, which is very ironic. And there's an article here from Mental Floss that dives, dives into that. Um, George Eastman, his father died when he was eight. He dropped out of school at 14. He basically went on to build the Eastman Kodak fam, uh, company. Now, the irony here why I mention it is Basically, Kodak and Polaroid are synonymous with missing out on innovation when digital imaging came around. And the reason why I think it's an interesting case study is that even the disruptors get disrupted. Henry Ford you know, built the Ford Motor Company and he really pioneered the assembly line technique of mass production. Unfortunately, he was a Nazi sympathizer. So that obviously wasn't cool. Uh, Madam CJ Walker uh, went on to become the first female self-made millionaire at least according to Guinness Book World of Records. And her claim to fame and success was she basically created her own African hair care product. Uh, Coco Chanel, same thing. Her mother died at 12, put in an orphanage. She went on to basically build one of the most iconic brands in women's fashion. Frederick Jones, same thing, came from a troubled childhood. Um, and he went on to pioneer basically refrigeration. He co-founded Thermo King. And Estee Lauder, another example, born to Jewish immigrants, basically pioneered the Estee Lauder company and is known as one of the most influential business geniuses of the 20th century. So not just savvy in style and fashion, but much more. Ruth Handler basically built Barbie doll and she went on to be the president of Mattel, uh, which sold over a billion toys. Henry Luce, uh, he had political aspirations, never won office, but by virtue of finding uh, Time Magazine, Fortune Sports Illustrated, he was actually called the most influential private citizen in America. So entrepreneurship has always been around. The common denominator, though, was always adversity of necessity. Nobody actually woke up, I think, and was driven as much by ambition as much as it was by adversity and necessity. Um, but there is this dynamic of people who are supposedly born on third base. Now, again, I, I want to make this class entertaining. If I refer to people, it's really not to be rude or offensive, but 
you know, I guess I sometimes permit myself to say things that other people may not be comfortable. So a little bit of preface as I get into this next section. So I don't know how many of you have been watching Succession, great show on HBO. It's basically, you know, based on the Murdoch family. Um, and so there's this great line that this coach who went on to coach the Dallas Cowboys, Barry Switzer, but while he was in college, when he was coaching, I believe, Oklahoma, he said, quote, some people are born on third base and go through life thinking they hit a triple, end quote. Great, great line. And in fact, people use that now all the time. Mitch Garber, a very successful uh, local entrepreneur, uh, lawyer, entrepreneur, definitely more self-made um, than born on third base, definitely. He went on to say, when discussing Pierre Carpellado, the Quebec or CEO, quote, you will always be the guy born on third base, but convinced that you hit a triple, end quote. Now, is that a fair knock? Look, you could criticize Monsieur Pellado for many, many things. I've always taken a very different approach, which is basically, humor me, you will encounter people who were born into privilege. Uh, you, 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 people don't choose where they're born into. Um, I personally don't criticize builders. When I started my career, very, very often, I would encounter people who were born with, in the right family who had the last name. I, I've never met Stephen Bronfman, but when I see Stephen Bronfman trying to bring back the Expos, I think some of that is driven by a desire to, you know, legacy. His father, Charles, obviously founded the Expos. Um, I've met Jeff Molson. You know, you could knock Jeff Molson for many things. He's a very smart businessman. Uh, he did elbow me out of the Just for Laughs deal when we were close to acquiring Just for Laughs a few years ago. But while it's easy to knock people, I actually say, look, these are people who could have basically just retired into the sunset and enjoyed you know, the fruits of their previous generation's labor. But when I see people trying to build, I don't knock them. Maxime Reniard, a um, very successful media executive, his father built um, a, a very successful waste management company. He had media aspirations. Um, you know, he wanted to buy Watch Mojo a few years ago. Now, I, I say this really in jest, and I've said this to him. He talked me out of selling my business to Bell Media, only to proceed to sell his business to media, which was uh, Group B and Nubo and all that. But ultimately, as a business person, as an entrepreneur, you are going to come across people that you want to be part of their arena. And what I've learned over 20 years is, it's kind of normal that that elite group will not want you in their arena and your path. Why I'm saying all this is you have to go out there and build your own arena. And we're gonna come back to that. Uh, a few years ago, Fort, uh, Forbes raised some eyebrows by putting Kylie Jenner um, on the list, on their uh, cover and asking and calling her the, the youngest self-made billionaire ever. Now, is Kylie Jenner really self-made? The truth is it depends, yes and no, context is king. I personally don't think that any, even in 2022, that any woman, any person of color, anybody who's a member of the LGBT community, I don't think if they ever feel like they're born on third base because there is a lot of discrimination, there is a lot of prejudice. So I'm sure for them, it's a bit jarring. That said, if I am a black lesbian entrepreneur who is trying to make ends meet and I see Kylie Jenner on the cover of Forbes, I am irate and go, she is not self-made. So a little bit of context is, is required, but if you really want to ask yourself, am I, like, are you an entrepreneur? The most purest, authentic of entrepreneurs don't tear down fellow entrepreneurs. Yes, we are competitive, but even in my darkest, deepest days, when I had, I didn't have two nickels to rub together and I had the, the, the specter of payroll every two weeks, when I would see a fellow entrepreneur raise financing or encounter success, I was legitimately happy for them. So if you want an honest assessment of, hey, am I really an entrepreneur? I assure you the best peers entrepreneurs are actually happy that other entrepreneurs do well. Um, going back throughout history, William Randolph Hearst, you could argue born on third base. His parents were really successful. His father was a very successful senator and businessman. He borrowed $10 million from his mother to buy uh, San Francisco newspapers and used that newspaper to expand yellow journalism, nothing to do with race. It just it was for the paper it was printed on. He was very much a warmonger um, in the sense that he was telling photographers, you give me the pictures, I will give you a war. 
He diversified over time and broadcast assets. Today, Hearst is one of the best run companies that I know. Years ago, they invested 20% into ESPN. And since then, they've made many bets in B2B healthcare. Uh, what's really smart about what he did is he, however, realized that he did not necessarily want his born on third base kids to just take over the business and think that this God given divine ability to manage and run an organization. So while there are Hearst family members on the board, the company is run by professional managers. And I know many there, and it's a very well run company. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it's not necessarily Hearst's grandparents, grandkids and great grandkids. Um, Rupert Murdoch. Okay, that's not Rupert Murdoch. That's Darth Vader. That is Rupert Murdoch. So Rupert Murdoch, you know, to be honest with you, on the one hand, probably a very evil individual, but at the same time, he's one of the people that, oddly enough, he has redeeming traits as an entrepreneur, as a, as a newsman, you can't disrespect and knock that. He took over his dad's newspaper, moved from Australia to England, finally to the USA. He used that print foundation to wade into satellite and TV. Definitely, arguably, definitely the inspiration for Logan Roy and Succession. And oh, what's this? A cloud. What am I foreshadowing? So again, later on, earlier on, we discussed Madame movie producer Kevin Martin. I said how later on when we discuss NDAs and litigation and defamation and all that, we'll talk about my experiences there. Also, later on when we discuss legal, I'm going to make sure that if you ever have to sign a non-competition agreement and you ever have to face an injunction, I share my experiences with you because fun fact, Mr. Murdoch indirectly uh, when News Corp, Fox bought IGN, which had bought Ask Men. They sued myself and Watch Mojo in 2006. Yay. Uh, but I went to court, represented myself, and I beat them. And as much as it was a painful experience, and I assure you, despite my exterior confident facade that day at court, that it was May of 2006, I was scared, you know what, but it taught me so much and it set the stage for the success that Watch Mojo ultimately had. That's an article I wrote uh, recently, the lawsuit that nearly killed, but ultimately helped Watch Mojo. I will share that as well uh, after the class if you guys want to read it. it. Goes on and on. A lot of people who were successful entrepreneurs, they did inherit things. They took the business and then they made it bigger. Uh, Madame Prada being an example. Bill Gates was an interesting uh, you know, example. His father was you know, um, it was a middle class family, a lawyer, dad, teacher, mother, um, but he was a voracious reader student. And Bill Gates basically went out and he arguably built the first great technology company that was like an icon. And for the longest time, he was the world's richest man. Now, the point I'm getting to with Bill Gates is, you know, clearly we all have shoulders of others that we stand on. Bill Gates was not born on third base, but you can't argue that he didn't have some privilege. But the key is, what do you do with that privilege? That's really what all of this is, is pertaining to. So the impact of the Industrial Revolution, really, really the main thing, was that it reduced um, the life expectancy and it reduced mortality of kids. And what that did is it created a supply and a demand group, right? I mean, if this was some other economics class, we would spend far more time on it. But the main point is, the Industrial Revolution just improved the standard of living of so many people. And then the impact of the technological revolution, which the progress, so, so to speak, that would refer to started off with semiconductors. And that led, basically that's the silicon in Silicon Valley comes from the semiconductor chips. And then the personal computer with Bill Gates' vision to have a computer on every desk basically took on greater uh, impact with the rise of the internet, which was actually built in the late 60s as an army project called ARPANET. And then in the 80s and 90s, a Swiss programmer named Tim Berners-Lee actually built the World Wide Web. He's the one who actually um, could have kept that. And he opened it up and he was very unselfishly uh, then paved the way for people like Mark Andreessen to build Mosaic, which was the first browser that really had a lot of success that went on to become Netscape. And we're going to look a little bit later on uh, about the dot-com era. That paved the way for mobile, which obviously the iPhone just you know, hit it out of the park. And now we're moving towards this internet of things where your refrigerator will be a screen, your wall will be a screen, your TV is going to be one big chip, one big phone that happens to drive you from point to point. Now, the irony is this is progress, but as that image connotes, is it really progress? I don't know. 
so again, foreshadowing in the next class, uh, we'll look actually at the dot-com era a bit more. And the main reason for that is because a lot of the success that you see today were actually first iterated in that era. Before Facebook, you had MySpace. Before MySpace, you had Friendster. And before that, you had GeoCity. So the last thing I want you guys to do, if you are interested in pursuing entrepreneurship in the digital media realm, is to say, I got a great idea and not be aware of history because those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And so what, what this boom of this technological revolution has done is it's created an explosion in global consumers. China, India, Brazil, all these emerging nations are basically now consumers who are ready to go to watch, buy, whatever it is that you are producing and offering. And that has been a game changer. And the dot-com era really changed entrepreneurship. If you wanna understand why entrepreneurship is a sexy field, look at these good looking handsome men, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, who met at Stanford, didn't really like each other at first, launched this project called Backrub, which was later on went on to become Google. It was not the first search engine. When they were in beta, I was working at a company called Mama, which was pretty big and pretty successful. They went on and raised money from two of the top VC firms, and they actually benefited from the crash of the dot-com. And I would say today, to me, even though Apple just hit $3, bill, uh, $3 trillion in market capitalization, if somebody came to me and said, what is the best position company, period, I would say probably Alphabet, Google. And we're going to discuss that obviously later on. Elon Musk, person of the year, according to Time Magazine, world's richest person, has a lot of tremendous traits, but like all many faults, a flawed individual, built PayPal, launched SpaceX, and now through Tesla is ambitiously trying to change um, a lot of things. So what drives people? Again, I hope I'm not going too fast. Today, I really want to take you through like a, you know, a, a kind of like a look and profile of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs, because without understanding the psychology and what motivates people, all of the rest about business plans and products and SWOT analysis is, is kind of useless in my humble opinion. So recently, uh, before I, I knew that I would teach this class, I write a lot. So I was going to write an article about what drives people. And I asked my network on Facebook and I asked my network on LinkedIn. And I like doing these little drawings and maps. And by the way, you will have a little assignment where you're going to have to basically visualize some concept. And we'll talk about why you, you want to learn to do that now, not later. And I kind of got a bunch of, you know, I had a bunch of things myself that I thought drove people, but I also wanted to open it up. And I would say everything, by the way, I put in a matrix or a quadrant. There are things that are tangible and there are things that are intangible. And then there are means and then the end. And I think, you know, some people think of money or wealth or salary or titles. People are driven by, you know, fame and recognition and awards and connections. Some people want respect, credibility, power, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also a lot of things that are more intangible, like just knowledge and happiness and fulfillment and self-actualization. You as an entrepreneur are driven by a, a, a sum, a function of these things. But it's important to understand this because if you want to be an effective leader, different people are going to be motivated by these different things. And what allows you to lead effectively, Joe, is very different than what you will be able to um, need to do to lead Michelle. Michelle and Joe are very different people, so your playbook has to adapt for each one of them. What drives people? I will share this with you again, don't need it all. It's basically Sir Anthony Hopkins, a two-time Academy Award winner for Best Actor. He goes on and on, let go of people, but I will share this later for the spirit of time. What I really, really, really want to stress louder for those in the back, Humans are driven by insecurities. This is the, the quote I want to read. I know your instinct is to do everything you can to gain the appreciation of those around you, but it's an impulse that steals your time, energy, mental, and physical health, end quote. This, I wish I would have read when I was 20, when I was 21, when I was 25. This is what, and by the way, note to self, don't cast stones from a glass house. I was driven, and I am driven by a lot of insecurities. As a young Iranian boy growing up in Canada, what do you see when you hear of Iran? Okay, you Google, let's say if Google existed, what is the top search result? US embassy hostage taking. Hmm, not a great, despite your rich history, 3000 years, that's what you see. Then you turn around, oh, what's this movie? Not without my daughter. Mm -hmm. So growing up, 
a lot of my insecurities, and this is all later on I wrote about this stuff, was because as much as I viewed myself as Canadian, what happened to really give me that kind of shock? 9-11. I'm an atheist. Out of respect, I say I'm an agnostic because others believe more power to them. But, you know, the reality is I grew up with a lot of Jewish friends. I grew up in Snowden. I grew up, uh, you know, near uh, Hampstead and St. Luke. And I was, you know, blind to religion. But after you graduate from finance and you want to have a career in finance or media after 9-11 as a kid named Ashkan Karbis Fushan, um, yeah, it's kind of hard. You're an outsider. Another thing that was a big insecurity of mine, but insecurities can become a chip on your shoulder that motivates you, is irony of ironies. I got into McGill. I remember it was January of 1996. I opened the letter and it goes, congratulations, you've been admitted in the management, uh, in the Bachelor of Arts program. Nothing wrong with that, but I'm like, hmm, is that a typo? I applied to get into management, thought it, despite being a pretty good student, I had one grade that was below 75. I was not admitted into management. At McGill, I was kind of heartbroken. I was disappointed. Concordia today, frankly, has a very good reputation in their business school. It did not at the time. I went to Concordia, and Concordia, the reality is, it's just a far more entrepreneurial place. Had I gone to McGill, I probably would not be sitting here. Another insecurity, you're in your young 20s, you start to lose your hair. Is it cause, causality, chicken or egg? Why are so many entrepreneurs follically challenged? I don't know, maybe it's the drive or maybe it's one or the other. In any case, we are all driven by insecurities. The other theme that I cover a lot, and frankly, one of my success tools is I recognize that we are constantly struggling between the sins and the virtues. I'm not religious, but that really is a useful thing to read and educate yourself on. We're going to talk a lot more about pride. Pride, hubris, we say hubris is 100 times pride, but there's a very fine line. There's a, you know, it's just, you add a little bit of a tonic and pride becomes hubris, envy, wrath, greed, and the virtues. And balancing that uh, and balancing fear and greed is really the constant struggle. Every day I have to make a decision between fear and greed. Doesn't mean I'm fearful, doesn't mean I'm greedy. But that's basically the constant decision, the juggling act that you have to do. Speaking of greed um, and, and all those impulses and insecurities, Mark Zuckerberg. So I joke, Facebook is a partner, so I want to stress this is a joke. I joke that Mark Zuckerberg is the love child of Lex Luthor and Darth Vader. Um, you know, YouTube, for all of its success, actually was started off as a kind of hot or not, which was an old, we'll call it dating app. Um, as it was basically started off as something where you could share videos of attractive people. Um, and then very quickly they realized, hey, there's another application here. Facebook started off to help Mark pick up girls. Um, he did effectively, for lack of a better word, rip off the Winklevoss brothers and his co-founders, right? I mean, those are more or less fact. Maybe the word rip off is a bit harsh, um, but nonetheless, he's widely criticized for heavily copying other products like Snap, which is the playbook in Silicon Valley. But I actually think if we're talking about entrepreneurs, our principles, our values are very different, but he's almost like the Tom Brady of entrepreneurs. What he's built is very impressive, although you could disagree with a lot of the externalities and the ripple effects of it. The main difference between Facebook and Google, and frankly, Facebook and Apple, is Mark Zuckerberg, not Mark Zuckerberg himself. It's the fact that it's still very much the founder, entrepreneur who makes all the decisions. Alphabet, Sergey and Larry are not that involved. They have professional managers. So when they come to make a decision, their dynamics between fear and greed are very different than Mark Zuckerberg's fear and greed dynamics. When Apple makes a decision, Tim Cook, who is openly gay, who was the number two to Steve Jobs, so those are his insecurities and those are the challenges that he's had, he makes decisions very differently. He may have no problem doing a deal with China that others raise their eyebrows, but if there's something that, for example, is pushing the envelope a bit too much, he's not going to be as driven by greed as Mark Zuckerberg is. So again, if you want to have success, you need to understand people. And if you want to understand people, you need to understand it's all about psychology. So I hope this is entertaining. If this we were in class, I could see if you guys are asleep or if you guys are leaning in. So that much, uh, I'm going to assume you're still here with me. So a few years ago, I used to write for TechCrunch. And TechCrunch said, OK, um, you know, Facebook is going to do an IPO. This, if my eyes see it, was 2012. 
And they said, do you mind writing something about Mark Zuckerberg? And I said, okay, I'm not a product guy. I'm not gonna dissect Facebook's you know, new, new app or something. But that was the first time that I kind of said, okay, is there such a thing as like a recipe or ingredients for success? And then I said, okay, I think it's vision, ambition, execution, persistence, luck, um, and, and, and vision. Uh, and later on, I would add focus and resiliency, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this one by one. So if you don't have ambition, there could be, you don't wanna have blind ambition, but if you're not an ambitious person, I just don't think you could pursue an entrepreneurship because it's very competitive and you want to chase the ball and get it before the other people do. It's not like sports where there's one champion and a runner up. In entrepreneurship, a lot of people could succeed, but at the same time, hey, if I open up my idea, legal ethics aside, if I open up my idea and say, hey, I wrote this book on Alexander the Great, you're exposing yourself to somebody else taking that idea and running with it. Two, vision. Vision is actually two. Vision with a capital V is Kumbaya. I saw that like the future was going to, of storytelling was moving to the internet, was moving to mobile, it was moving to short form content, ergo I created Watch Mojo. That's like big idea. Vision is also a lower case. It's just understanding the data, the facts. It's, you got to educate yourself, right? What do these images have in common? If this was a class, I'd ask for people to guess. Does anybody want to shout out or what, what do these have in common? So if you click on this link, which I won't do now because I don't want to totally disrupt the, the presentation, you would basically see you know what, let's do it, let's go crazy. If you click on this presentation, which you should still see, my everything seems to be a bit slow. Come on, drum roll. I usually have better. Okay, let's just go back. Oh no, here it is. If you click on this presentation, you basically realize that everything is so slow when you're on Zoom, but in any case, it's the same thing. It's the same image basically seen through different perspectives. And a little side note, we'll talk a little bit about diversity and all that. But when it comes to diversity, when it comes to inclusion, is because these are basically the vantage points of different people who are seeing the same thing from their experiences, right? And that boils down to vision as well. Execution. I would play this. I won't. because For sure, there's going to be an ad. But basically, before it, any given Sunday, Great line, great scene. It's a two, three minute video. I will share it for those who have not seen it. It's a game of inches. And you really, as you get bigger, as you get closer to the you know, end zone, every inch becomes harder to attain. But every play, you have an opportunity to execute. And when I played soccer, I never minded if somebody took a shot and we didn't score, but I always minded when people didn't finish their play because that means that they've exposed themselves and they've exposed their teammates. So you gotta finish your play, you gotta execute. Kumbaya vision is great, but you know, ideas without execution is nothing. This is one of my favorite quotes of all time. The number one thing to succeed in life is persistence, tenacity, determination, perseverance, whatever you wanna call it, that. Calvin Coolidge, former president, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence, talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan press on has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race, end quote. That printed, put it on your wall, I assure you is key. Luck. Any entrepreneur, any athlete, any musician, anybody that basically says luck didn't have anything to do with their success is a liar. I am lucky all the time. Yes, preparation, education, practice then creates your luck and you have to be at the right place at the right time. But the way the ball bounces uh, does come into play. Timing, even a broken clock tells the right time twice a day, but you have to understand and appreciate timing and really timing dictates everything else. We caught lightning in a bottle. Oh, there's a cloud foreshadowing. We're gonna look at the case study of YouTube and how YouTube destroyed the competition. That's my email, sorry, that's a reply from Steve Chen back in 2006 from YouTube. Steve Chen was one of the co-founders. Bizarro World, he's asking me if we are embedding YouTube content on watchmojo.com and my point is I recognized very early that online video was gonna change the world, but I also had to pick the right platform. 
And this article, YouTube is wildly profitable. This was before Google bought them. I basically was like, YouTube is, is a juggernaut. And I called YouTube the greatest M&A of all time in media as early as 2011. And uh, yeah, and then it, in 2019, when VidCon wanted to do like a recap of YouTube on its 15 year anniversary, they were kind of to ask me to go speak. I'll share that video as well. It's also in the course syllabus. And it kind of takes you through the evolution of YouTube. We're gonna look at a case study of YouTube in a few uh, classes. Focus. Focus is one I added. And the reality is, let me not lie, in 2011 or 12, when I wrote that article, a lot of my industry friends, critics, were basically saying, Ash, you're all over the place. Watch Mojo. One day there's a cooking video. One day there's a travel video. One day there's a top 10 list. What the hell do you guys do? And I was like, we focus. We focus on video. You guys don't know what you're talking about. But eventually I realized that, yeah, maybe we're a bit all over the place. And we narrowed it down. And in a later class, I'll explain that a bit more. But focus only really counts once you know what to focus on. In, in tech jargon, it's once you find that product market fit, or as I call it in content, that platform format fit. After all, if you pivot too many times, you're back to where you started. I love this quote by Bruce Lee. I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. Lovely. Uh, resilience. I added this after COVID. And resilience, I actually think, even though persistence is more important, resilience eats persistence for lunch. You do need to be resilient because you take a lot of shots and I assure you that morning when I woke up and I found out that Madame Movie Producer was pursuing a project with Alexander the Great, it didn't feel too good. And I had to show resilience to just focus and do my job. But we'll talk about that later on. Now, what else? I have eight. You know, I read this quote, what is investment? Usain Bolt won eight gold medals in three Olympics, but he only ran 115 seconds on a track. He earned a ton of money, but I don't think he was driven by money as much. So for those two minutes on the track, he trained 20 years. That's investment, thing long-term, patience. So what else would you add to this list? Practice, patience, discipline. There's definitely a word for this. Now, you say you want to be a hustler. I got some news for you. Not everyone should or can be an entrepreneur. And I'm sorry to break that news to you. It's not up to me, though, to determine if you're an entrepreneur or not. It's really up to you. But it's fine not to be an entrepreneur. I was not ready to be an entrepreneur when I graduated school at 21, right? It took me six years, a lot of headaches, a lot of heartbreaks to get myself in a position. And frankly, yeah, I'm not an envious person, but some envy, but not envy for material things. I envy being somebody who could make decisions. I wanted to allocate capital. I wanted to be the person that when there was a problem could fix it. So I said, the only way I could do that is by putting myself in that driver's seat. But the good news about entrepreneurship is you really only have to be right once. One of my insecurities is I don't want to be known as the top 10 guy. I don't want to be known as the guy that just was like, hey, he basically just took a concept that existed and put it on YouTube. That's great. And frankly, that's enough to like get your mention in the Entrepreneurship Hall of Fame. But you really only have to be right once. Timing matters. The name of the game of entrepreneurship, as I like to call it, is you got to survive to put yourself in a position to thrive. But you got to get in the game first. But Entrepreneurship is hard. Whenever I hear people saying, why aren't you being an entrepreneur? Why don't you start a business? Uh, because mortgage, because kids, my spouse won't support it. I would not be here without my spouse, not just because she's one of the co-founders and she plays a vital part, but because in those early lean years, she never once came and questioned me and complained. And that's key. And I don't lose sight of that privilege or perspective. So your opportunity cost, what it costs you to leave what it is that you do is really, really uh, paramount. Your life stage, if you got kids, doesn't make it impossible, but it makes it much harder. Same thing with working from home. I don't lose sight of the fact that for some of my employees, if they got kids, very different dynamic than the younger folks who may not have kids. So managing your burn rate, maintaining your runway, and just understanding finance and administration can save you when it comes to entrepreneurship. Then you gotta get used to rejection. So this is a letter from 1979, where some label basically tells YouTube to go pound sand. I was rejected over a hundred times. It's part of the game. You gotta drown out your biggest critic and your biggest fan. Those outliers, you know, if your mom thinks you're wonderful, great, that's her job. 
And if your biggest critic is somebody that has it in you because you dated, you know, they're, you used to date their spouse or something, again, you got to discount that. You want people to go from saying, hey, good luck with that business pal to I always believed in you, buddy. That's the same person. The very same people that today come to me and go, Ash, I always believed in you are the same people that 10, 15 years ago were like, I don't get watch Mojo. This makes no sense. YouTube is for losers. Really? Now, what are some of the myths of entrepreneurship? One myth is that winners are always right and winners never make mistakes. That's impossible. Michael Jordan, you can debate whether LeBron James or Michael Jordan is better. They're both amazing. Michael was just very clutch. This is another epic quote. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I was trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. That's true. I mess up so many times. My former CFO always was like, you have such good judgment. He was like 80, 90, 100%. I was like, that's not possible. But in my eyes, I always think of the mistakes I make. I don't know who Rick Lenz is, but I was looking for something to add here. Um, it's not personal, it's business, is bullshit. It, everything is personal. Now, the key is not to soil relationships, not to burn bridges. But anybody that tells you it's not personal, it's business, takes business very personal. So be realistic. Now, a myth is that it's a young person's game. That's not really true. Again, I think it's more about the life stage. It's harder if you got a two-year-old than if your two-year-old is not 20 and off to college, yeah. But there's a lot of very successful people who started businesses really late. Now, Ray Kroc did not start McDonald's, for example, but he was definitely entrepreneurial and eventually the entrepreneur that took it to the next level. Many, many examples, and I'm surprised the best one is in here, which is the founder of Walmart, Sam Walton. He started in his 50s and 60s as well. Now, some harsh realities, ageism is a reality. Totally, there's discrimination against older people in entrepreneurship. And I think that's why entrepreneurship is so great for younger people. And I think why WatchMojo is a very unique employer is we actually value you because we got to stay on top of pop culture and the trends. Sexism is a thing. I won't even read this. This is somebody that just the other day I saw on Twitter. She basically said, I went from being a cocktail. Miami, by the way, is having a bit of a tech renaissance. It's like a lot of people from Silicon Valley and a lot of people from New York are heading down there. She wrote, I went from being a cocktail waitress in Miami to running a million dollar business. Anything is possible. Now I replied saying, or I retweeted saying, nothing wrong with being in the service or, or being a waiter wait, waitress. I used to be one, um, but this is the power of entrepreneurship. And then she wrote, this is why you don't see women sharing their story because these two idiots went out and said really horrible things. Now, this is wrong, but the point is, if you're gonna be out there as an entrepreneur, people are gonna take shots at you, but sexism is a thing. This is another great quote, citizenship in a republic. It's called man in the arena. I, I, I refer to as person in the arena. It's not the critic who counts, not the person who points out how the strong person stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the person who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, and who at the worst, if he or she fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that their place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Teddy Roosevelt, 1910. Awesome, awesome quote. It's part of a longer article. I will link to it. So that's that. I wanted to take you guys through a little bit of the intangibles of entrepreneurship, and now we're gonna get into the great composition. At a high level, using feedback from the gentleman, Rob Nason, who asked me if I wanted to cheat, and a lot uh, to cheat, cheat, Freudian slip, I hope not, to teach, and from Elias, who is my teacher's assistant, um, we wanted to do something that was equally balanced between individual and group. But I wanted this to be a fruitful exercise. 